Thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Watson, and this is the Influence Watch podcast. We have a very special episode this week as we discuss a major decision by the Supreme Court. Today, the Supreme Court decided a pair of cases concerning partisan gerrymandering, holding that congressional redistricting is an inherently political process, and therefore a non-justiciable political question, meaning mostly liberal challengers to the for now mostly Republican-drawn congressional maps will not be able to claim that those maps are too partisan, whatever that means, in federal court. Joining me is Capital Research Center investigative researcher Hayden Ludwig, who will play host as we dig into my report, The Myth of Nonpartisan Districts, an experimental examination of just how much the current congressional districts deviate from liberals' supposed ideal of proportional representation when assessed on a state-by-state -state basis, since representatives are constitutionally apportioned among the states. Hey, Mike, glad to be here. So let's dig into your report a little bit, uh, but first some background. So today, the Supreme Court handed out a decision on partisan gerrymandering, but can you explain a bit what's going on with partisan redistricting, aka gerrymandering, and the court's decision today? So uh, there had been a challenge to the congressional maps in Maryland and in North Carolina. Maryland drawn by a Democratic legislature and North Carolina drawn by a Republican legislature. And the challengers had said that they could show that these maps were drawn to advantage the party that drew the maps and that therefore they should be thrown out uh, as unfair. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, heard the case and it issued its decision today finding that uh, with how the maps are drawn is a fundamentally political question. There's what's known in law, there's the political question doctrine, which says that if something is inherently political, the court should defer to the elected branches unless there's a very good reason not to. You know, with, with, the, with the decision, what it means is that uh, legislative redistricting, partisan redistricting in the states that, in the 46 states that have some form of party-based uh, districting, the 46 states, uh, it's not all 46, some of them are single member districts. There are four have an independent commission. Sure. And the, and the remainder are either single member or either a single district like Alaska, or they have a legislative or some other uh, party-based redistricting system, like say a Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina. So what the what the court's decision holds is that it will stay the way it has been. Uh, you know, the name gerrymandering comes from Alfred Gerry, who was a signer, who was uh, a, a, one of the founding fathers. He was around at the beginning of the Republic. Right. So it's been around for a long time. I mean, we're going to get to a little bit on the background later, but it, but gerrymandering, we should say up front, is really a political name for a process. Uh, redistricting that's been around yeah, since the, the it, Constitution right, was created. It's, it's as old as our form of the legislature, which is we elect our legislature uh, with single-member districts. And where those district boundaries are can either favor or disfavor a candidate or a party, depending on who's in the district. Uh, and again, going back to the beginnings of the Republic, where you had Gary you know, had a district that looked like a salamander <laughs> that advantaged his party, and that's where the term... You know, the, the G has gone soft, so it's now gerrymandering. <laughs> uh, that's that's where the term comes from. And what the Supreme Court decided today was that's been going on forever. It's a political question. It's a political doctrine. And it's up to the political process to do anything about it if something is to be done about it. Well, and that's a good way to, to express it, that ultimately this is inherently a political thing, right? Not, not, a, not so much a policy question as a political question, which leads us into our next point here. I have your uh, newly released report, The Myth of Nonpartisan Districts, here. Let's talk a little bit about your experiment and uh, what you found. Sure. So what, uh, what I did is I took the, the state vote totals from the uh, House of Representatives elections from 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, and the most recent Congress in 2018, and ran those vote totals through a proportion, an allocation of proportional representation, uh, sort of like how the European Parliament is elected by proportional representation in each country. So that would mean that if people, fifteen percent of the people vote for the socialist right, party, right, more, more or less. It's a little, it's a little technical. There's a lot of math involved. Fortunately, a guy made a calculator that made the math easy. <laughs> um, but that, that is basically the idea, and. After running all those numbers for the 2018 elections, what it turned out was that the Republican favoring districts and the Democratic favoring districts in other states canceled each other out. The, the, uh, the size of the Democratic caucus would not change. There'd be one fewer Republican replaced by a member of the Conservative Party of New York. 
So that's fascinating. So um, briefly, tell us a little bit, uh, proportional representation versus uh, the winner-take-all system that we currently have. How would you define the two? Uh, well, the, the winner-take-all system is easy. You you have uh, the country or the state. In this case, the states. We have to be careful. You know, the, the House of Representatives is a portion to the states, yes. not to the nation at large. The, the states are cut up into little into little districts, and there's an election, and whoever gets the most votes wins, unless you're in Maine, which decided to be weird. In proportional representation, whatever the jurisdiction is, in this case, you know, for this experiment, it was the states as a whole. Uh, you know, if you look at the European Parliament, some of the countries are divided into districts, others are divided in not single-member districts like we have, but multi-member districts. So like four or five members will be elected proportionally instead of one guy winner take all. And the the way it ha- you know, you, you cast votes, you cast votes for a party, and then the seats are allocated to the party based on how many votes you get. And there's the mathematical formula that determines, uh, you know, who gets the first seat, who gets the second seat, who gets the third seat, so on and so forth, all the way to the end. So really what we're saying is, is um, liberal supporters of a proportional representation system believe that that kind of system would afford them, the Democratic Party, more seats in Congress. Is that right? Many of them would. I, I, many of them would. Um, the, you know, our, our, my, my findings were that they would have gotten more but not enough to take the majority in, in, the, other, uh, in the other years, uh, in the, the 2010 through 2016. Part of that is because there is a bias in a single-member system, even if there's no partisan gerrymandering whatsoever, towards a suburban and rural-based party. Uh, the Democratic districts in places like New York City, San Francisco, uh, you know, the inner the inner loop of Chicago that are uh, that are you know, the partisan voting index is a number that tells you how Democrat or Republican a district is. Uh, you know, the Democrat ones have, a, there are a lot of that are D plus 30, D plus 40, oh, D which is, a, which is about as high, yeah, D for Democratic. Uh, and that's about, you know, that's almost st- as statistically high as you can get. If it was, the average was a hundred percent Democratic every election. <laughs> uh, so the, so a lot of very extremely Democratic districts because of the concentration of Democratic voters, even without intentional gerrymandering. Whereas the Republic, the safer Republican districts are in the Republican plus 10, Republican plus 15 hmm, kind of range. Uh, and there are some more of those. So the median precinct in the 2016 general election, 2016 presidential election, uh, the median precinct uh, voted for Donald Trump, even though Hillary Clinton won a majority of the aggregate vote. That's fascinating. Or not, a, not a majority, won, a, uh, won more aggregate votes than Donald yeah. Trump did. Yeah, an absolute number. Um, well, let's shift over a little bit back to the Supreme Court's um, pretty major decision today, or, or I guess you could say almost a lack of a decision, even though it is a decision, right? Um, it's, so, it's, it's a decision to let the status quo stand. <laughs> <laughs> so now that the um, the court has decided to allow partisan redistricting to continue, uh, what does that really mean down the road? I guess specifically, does that mean that whichever party wins the 2020 elections and draws lines after the 2020 census are they guaranteed to just win forever after that? As the 2018 elections should have indicated to anyone, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> what we what we see in this experiment is that there is district lines decay. Uh, you know, the district districting advantage decays a little bit over time, and especially if there's a major change in the political atmosphere. So between 2016 and 2018, 2016, uh, you know, President Barack Obama is in office. Uh, the questions are, you know, what are we going to do about health care? What are we going to do about uh, about public spending? Uh, and what are we going to do about taxes? And then in 2018, President Donald Trump's in office. The questions are, what are we going to do about immigration? What are we going to do about national identity? And also, are we going to tax, are we going to pass a tax law change that's going to hurt uh, suburban homeowners in high-tax states like New Jersey and Virginia? Uh and that you can end up in a situation where the the district lines that you thought were going to be good for you end up not being good for you. And that's what happened to Republicans in New Jersey between 2016 and 2018. Huh. Uh, the, the district maps, which were drawn by a commission of politicians, technically evenly divided with an independent arbiter, but the independent arbiter had served in Republican administrations. These are the so-called independent this commissions. This is not an independent commission. This is different ah. than an independent commission. 
uh, this is a politician's commission. <laughs> even better, right? Even, even better. <laughs> um, and so it had it had drawn lines that maximized the that gave the Republicans a in 2012 more seats than they were proportionally than they would have gotten under the proportional representation. By 2018, it was giving the Democrats four more seats than they were into, that they would have gotten under proportional wow. representation. Uh, <laughs> you, you, the 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 political dictionary term for this is a dummy mander. Uh, when you're you lose a bunch of seats all at once because your uh, your lines that gave you you know that were really good until you lost by five by you know let's say five points. So it's like gerrymander in reverse almost. It's when you gerrymandered yourself out of seats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fascinating. Well, well. So we talked a little bit about where gerrymandering comes from. It's it's a it's more than two centuries old. It's a very old um, term. Um, the the Democrats though have talked a little bit about having a solution to this supposed problem. But um, what did your experiment say about it? And maybe say a little more about um, what gerrymandering or partisan redistricting is. Sure. You mentioned uh, you mentioned independent redistricting commission, and that's what their their solution is the so-called independent or citizens redistricting commission rather than having politicians from both sides you know fighting over it you have uh you know a certain mem- number of members registered voter members of a certain party and of the other party and of non-aligned non-part no party declared so california has something like this right yes yes and uh what california how the way california's worked out is that it was Further out of proportion than Texas, which had, which is a, you know, it's the big sort of representative Republican state. California is the representative big Democratic state. Uh, Texas has a partisan redistricting system. The state legislature draws the lines. The governor signs a bill. Those become the districts. Uh, California has this independent redistricting commission with a certain number of Democrats and a certain number of Republicans and a certain number of nonpartisan, you know, non-aligned members. And after the 2018 elections, California was sending 10 more Democrats to the U.S. House of Representatives than it would under proportional representation in our experiment. Wow, that's incredible. So really, it, it, it blew up their numbers far more than should have been proportional. Right, right. And, and the, you know, the Democrats in their H.R. 1 bill are pushing independent redistricting commissions as the quote-unquote solution to partisan district lines that supposedly favor one party or the other. And they're grandfathering in all the existing independent redistricting commissions, like California's, for reasons that should now be obvious. Um, you know, there, there is, and this is part of was part of uh, Chief Justice Roberts' decision today. Is there's no, there's no real scientific way to determine conclusively what a fair district is because it's an inherently because political. it is inha- because it is inherently political. Yes. Do, do, does the badness come from it being? not proportional does it come from it being you know drawn for with partisan intention you know th- those are political questions those are questions that are best left to legislatures to uh, to ballot initiatives and initiative states uh and to the political process not to judges which was chief justice roberts position right, right? as we, i understand it that this is something that the legislature needs to take care of not the judiciary right this is a matter of you know this in his decision, he said, essentially, this is a matter for the legislatures and for the states, uh, not for the federal judiciary. So this takes us into, you know, an interesting thing. We, we hear, I think most people are probably familiar with the term gerrymandering, but we hear a lot about it these days um, from the left, in particular, accusing Republicans of uh, uh, passing pro-Republican gerrymandered districts when they're redrawing congressional maps. Uh, we hear about this mostly in kind of that metropolitan liberal mainstream media, right? But Surely gerrymandering cuts both ways, right? Of course. Uh, you know, the in in our experiment, uh, we showed ob- obviously there were Republican states, states with legislative drawn lines by Republicans that returned more Republicans than were proportional. Uh, but there are also states that routinely sent more Democrats than were proportional. Like California. Just like, Cal- like California, despite its independent redistricting commission. <laughs> uh, New York State, uh Connecticut and Massachusetts are the two representative ones because they managed to wipe, they managed to have no Republicans in their districts. Wow. Even though, I mean, in Massachusetts, it's it's so difficult for the Republicans to compete that they didn't contest half the House elections in the state. 
over the wow. over the period. Well, and let's remember that they have a, a Republican governor, right? So yes, they do. They they've and they've had Republican governors going back to 1990, except for eight years. So it shows you that there's a disconnect so here they, between the governor's election and I mean, these the, congressional the, the elections. Only, uh, the only member of the U.S. Congress who was elected from the state of Massachusetts as a Republican during the period covered by this survey was Scott Brown elected statewide in 2010. Wow. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) In Connecticut, even though every single election, the Republicans would have gotten two seats under proportional representation, every single election they got zero. Hmm. So, again, maybe it's just the Democratic voters in those states are just perfectly distributed (laughs) such that the fairest districts would ensure no Republican representation. Or maybe the Democratic legislatures in, in those states are engaged in a bit of partisan gerrymandering. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so, what, so what does this all mean in practice? I mean, what you found in your report and, uh, and what we observed today. I mean, wrap this up for us a bit. Sure. The, you know, there's always going to be fighting over the political process. But, you know, the, the thing about process is, you know, probably best expressed by Michael Barone of the American Enterprise Institute, which is that all process arguments are insincere, including this one. (laughs) Um, You know, if the Democrats do really well in the 2020 elections and get elected to a bunch of state legislatures, they're going to do partisan, (laughs) they're going to do partisan redistricting. You know, it's it's highly likely they will do partisan, if they are anything like the Republicans after 2010, they are going to do partisan redistricting. It is going to advantage them until the, the, until the winds of politics change and all of a sudden they wonder where all these Republican voters came from. Right. It kind of does get blown a little bit out of proportion to its real impact. Uh, again, despite all the, the hue and cry about Republican districts, Republican-drawn districts, the Democrats won exactly the number of seats that they would have gotten under proportional representation by state uh, in the 2018 you know, midterm elections. You. The, the effect is not nearly what some of the some of the, the liberal groups that have been challenging this uh, have uh, have been saying that it, that it has especially when when considered at the national level as part of the broadly extended Republic sure so politics continues as it has for two and centuries. politics will continues <laughs> will continue as it has for two centuries except where it doesn't <laughs> well tell us where we can find your report Mike uh, at capitalresearch.org That's our show for this week. Thank you, Hayden, for joining us. You can find the full report at capitalresearch.org. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have subscribed, thank you. And please leave us a five-star rating. We'll see you next week.